Here's a number for everyone to think about today, 35.3 trillion, 35.3 trillion. That is our nation's debt number. As you can see, we've gotten there because of years of deficit spending. Right now, this massive sum, which is our national debt, <coughs> pardon me, represents more than $100,000 of indebtedness for every man, woman, and child in this country. While this number is almost impossible to comprehend, it poses one of the greatest threats to our nation's stability, security, and survival. To put this issue in perspective, <coughs> pardon me, Mr. President, to put this issue in perspective, our debt to GDP ratio is 121%, meaning our nation's debt is a fifth larger than our nation's annual economic output. Think about that. The debt is larger than our output. By comparison, our debt to GDP ratio at the end of World War II was 106%. That was the record high before we got to the COVID-19 pandemic. As our debt balloons, the annual cost of interest payments on the debt continues to rise. And this crowds out vital services that ought to be going to people that need them. In fact, through the first six months of fiscal year 2024, our country spent more taxpayer money servicing the debt than we spent on our military. We spent $440 billion on interest payments on our debt. When faced with this reality, Tennesseans and Americans will probably wonder, well, how did we get on this path to fiscal disaster? And of course, 35.3 trillion in debt didn't just appear overnight. Each year, the federal deficit, and I've got a chart here that goes back to 2005 and shows you what the debt, the deficit was every year. And this deficit, the annual difference between government spending and taxpayer money that's collected and coming into the federal government, all gets tacked onto our national debt. And under the Biden-Harris administration, this deficit spending has exploded. You can see these numbers. Last fiscal year, the federal deficit was nearly $1.7 trillion. It was up more than 21% from $1.4 trillion in 22. If you'll recall the Biden-Harris Inflation Reduction Act, the Green New Deal giveaway that Vice President Harris sat right up there and cast the tie-breaking vote for, was supposed to somehow miraculously reduce the debt. Still, so many Tennesseans say, how can you say you're going to spend more and that is going to reduce what you spend? It is void of common sense. In fiscal year 2021, meanwhile, the federal deficit reached more than $2.7 trillion. Now, we know some of that overlapped with the final couple of months of the Trump administration, but the spending occurred primarily under the Biden administration and under that $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan. It was the driving force of this administration's four-decade high inflation rate. Indeed, if you go back and you look at inflation, <clears throat> it was 1.4% the day that President Biden and Vice President Harris took office. Today, 
the latest numbers, 20.3%. In fact, excluding the emergency COVID spending in 2020, deficit spending under the Biden-Harris administration is at its highest point in American history. As I said, 121% of GDP. And previously, after World War II, it was at 106%. The only other administration that has come even close to these numbers under Biden-Harris is the Obama-Biden administration. Before congressional Republicans fought for and secured serious spending cuts, that administration ran annual deficits as high as $1.4 trillion between fiscal years 2009 and 2012. With deficits soaring again, our country needs another serious course correction. Yet under their 2025 budget proposal, the Biden-Harris administration has called for, and I want you to get this number, their 2025 budget proposal calls for $86 trillion in spending over the next 10 years. $86 trillion. It would increase our national debt, that $35.3 trillion number, it would increase it by $18 trillion. <clears throat> now, bear in mind, this is spending they are putting on the books. They're claiming it. They're out here shouting for it. Bidenomics, it is working. But again, Mr. President, we look at this and say, how can you spend more and then say you're reducing the deficit? It is void of common sense. Instead of fiscal recklessness, our country needs fiscal responsibility. Every year I have legislation that would slash federal spending, and I do these bills every year, by 1%, 2%, 5% for discretionary spending, excluding defense, homeland security, and veterans affairs. I fully believe anybody can find a way to save one penny, two pennies, or a nickel out of what they're given to spend. At a time when growth in government hiring is now outpacing growth in private sector hiring, Congress must also address the ballooning size of the federal government, which now employs nearly 2.4 million bureaucrats. It is time to start freezing salaries and freezing federal hiring. While there are many more steps that need to be taken to put America on a better fiscal trajectory, these moves would begin to tackle the threat that is posed to our nation and to our freedoms because of overspending. If we don't get busy with this and find some ways to wrestle with this debt and with this out of control spending, it's our children and grandchildren that will suffer by having to pay that bill. Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that the next portion of my remarks be placed separately in the record. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. Each year since 1961, the Country Music Association has inducted the legendary performers, songwriters, and artists of this uniquely American musical tradition into the Country Music Hall of Fame. In many ways, this distinction is the highest honor in country music, with names like Hank Williams, Chet Atkins, Dolly Parton, and Elvis Presley among its role of honor. Next month, three new names will join this legendary group during the Hall of Fame medallion ceremony. John Anderson, a force for traditionalism in country music who achieved 20 top 10 country singles across a five decade long career. James Burton, who is considered one of the greatest guitarists in all of music, performing and recording with the likes of Elvis, Merle Haggard, John Denver, and Emmylou Harris. 
and the late Toby Keith, an exceptional storyteller who brought joy to millions around the world through his music, especially to our men and women in uniform. While each artist has their own distinct sound and style, they share a music tradition that reminds every American of the things that truly matter, faith, family, freedom, hope, opportunity, and patriotism. To honor this incredible genre, this week I'm introducing a resolution that would designate October 2024 as Country Music Month. There's a reason the Grand Ole Opry, the most famous stage in country music, is known as the home of American music. Now is the perfect time for Congress to honor the contributions of country music and its legendary performers and artists to the story and the history of the United States. I yield the floor and note the absence of a quorum. Clerk will call the roll. Ms. Baldwin.